Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julia Caro, Senior Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's webinar is Latest Advances in Tumor Genomic Profiling for Challenging Samples. The sponsor of this webinar is Ion Torrent, which is part of Thermo Fisher Scientific. Our panelists today are Dr. Navi Sadri, Clinical Assistant Professor of Pathology at Universal Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center, and Dr. Jody McIntyre, Associate Director of Oncology Product Management at Thermo Fisher Scientific. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the control panel, which is usually on the right-hand side of your screen. Click on the Q&A box on the upper right side of, your, of the control panel, and when you click on Send To, please select All Panelists. We will ask our panelists your questions after their presentations have concluded. So our first speaker today is Dr. Sadri. Please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, the focus of my presentation will be to talk about our work with ion torrent system for biomarker testing in non-small cell lung cancer, in particular lung adenocarcinoma. I will focus on lung adenocarcinoma as it represents one of the more challenging specimens to profile given the sample types we see and is a good prototype of genomic-driven medicine given the multiple clinically relevant biomarkers. This slide outlines some of the biomarkers and relevant therapies linked to those biomarkers in lung adenocarcinoma. There's a decent number of biomarkers and the list continues to grow. And studies suggest that currently uh, molecular testing in the community, about 90% test for EGFR and ALK, but fewer than 30% test for emerging targets. And as such, uh, the NCCN guideline panel uh, advises for broader molecular profiling, with the goal of identifying rare driver mutations for which effective uh, drugs may be available. A very important study was undertaken by the Lung Cancer Mutation Consortium, uh, which consists of the 14 medical centers you see on the slide. This multi-institutional analysis across multiple different forms and sample types looked at over 1,000 patients uh, 1,000 samples to look for potential driver mutations in lung adenocarcinoma. One thing uh, this work showed was that the traditional sequencing testing had several drawbacks. Namely, it was very hard to cover all the targets, and there was a fairly high failure rate due to the amount of tissue available, which often was the rate-limiting step. And so the author suggested a more robust and broader profiling approach, such as next-generational sequencing, should be adopted. With that in mind, we sought to bring a NGS assay for lung adenocarcinoma that would be reliable, feasible, semi-comprehensive to be able to take in fusions and copy number variants, uh, scalable and cost-effective. And the panel had to be designed based on uh, clinical utility. Um, what makes non-small cell lung cancer samples challenging is their limited size. In our uh, cohort of over 200 cases we've tested, 80% uh, of our cases are core biopsies or fine needle aspirates. Here are two images of typical slides which we commonly receive, uh, showing truly how limited the tumor tissue can be. And when we quantify the DNA extracted, uh, over a third of the cases have less than 100 nanograms of DNA and 15% have less than 15 nanograms of DNA. As such, the assay needs to be able to maintain sensitivity and performance in low input samples. Uh, the assay also needs to be able to handle the real world variants that exist in histopathological processing. Samples from nine sites with their own independent histopathological processing, which affects assay performance, was tested. And here's the breakdown from the nine different sites. So this is the workflow we adopted. DNA and RNA was extracted from unstained slides using Kyogen All Prep uh, FFP kit. Library preparation was done using the OFA Oncomine Focus Assay uh, manually on day one. Template preparation uh, was performed using the Iron Chef HiQ View system overnight. On day two, sequencing is performed on the Iron PGM and uh, using um, 318 chips. 
Uh, and then analysis is started on the ion torrent suite, the ion reporter, and then using the Oncomine knowledge base uh, to help with annotation. A quick note, the uh, Oncomine knowledge base reporter is a pretty helpful clinical annotation tool we use to up, that is updated quarterly to help uh, populate our reports. I'll let Jody tell you more about it uh, in the second half of this talk. Um, before starting testing, we want to rigorously test the performance of this assay. So here's a quick outline of the DNA approach uh, we use. We use several characterized uh, reference material cell lines for copy number variation, as well as 44 uh, FFP tumor samples that have been tested by orthogonal methods such as Theraskin EGFR, then 10 IHC for ALK or Vices Fish, or by larger uh, commercial comprehensive uh, panel testing. Um, this is the outline of our RNA approach. Uh, to be honest, at first we were skeptical of how well this assay would perform with RNA and fugitive detection out of FFP material. Um, as such, the RNA was tested with as many fusions as we could get our hands on using reference material on 22 FFP tumor samples. To test how reproducible the assay would be, especially with potential RNA stability issues, in our reproducibility assays, we used samples that had been freeze thawed three times and tested over a two-month period. And to our uh, surprise, actually, the RNA assay performed very well in our hands. Here is a quick summary of the performance uh, of the assay, which uh, overall was very good. Uh, and then this was also a pretty uh, reliable assay. Here's a table showing 30 different runs using a TrueQ1 5% control. Uh, the top row shows the various hotspot mutations that are within this control. Uh, in green on the bottom is the expected variant frequency. In all but three instances, uh, the variant allele frequency fell within a 95% confidence interval expected at a coverage of 500x. Um, this slide really summarizes the main reason we decided to use this assay. It's uh, reliable, feasible, and very quick. Uh, complete successful testing was seen in 93% of the cases, 2.5% failing both RNA and DNA, 2% failing DNA only, and 2.5% failing RNA testing. Given that greater than 80% of our samples are biopsies and fine needle aspirates, this is actually very impressive. Um, and by keeping low the failure rates, we are able to reduce any um, delay in returning results in treatment and reduce any unnecessary rebiopsies re for just for genomic testing. Um, the, DNA, the DNA failures were mostly due to inadequate tissues, but there were several cases of severe deamination artifact that made analysis not possible. And RNA was due to inadequate tissues, or more commonly, there were several tissues from several sites that the starting RNA input was just very degraded. Uh, the turnaround time for this assay from DNA to RNA to sign out is truly two to three working days, and here's the breakdown of our turnaround times. And from block retrieval to sign out is uh, within five working days. Um, here's the result of 170 lung adenocarcinoma cases tested. These results are similar to a previous 240 samples tested by a larger commercial genomic comprehensive uh, panel testing. And you can see this assay can quickly detect a variety of biomarkers. I'd like to draw your attention to the currently FDA approved biomarkers, EGFR, ALK, and ABIRA, but also the emerging uh, uh, targets outlined by the guidelines. And then there's a variety of other uh, mutations that are uh, in gray that may stratify patients for potential clinical trials. And in closing, I'd just like to transition to three cases that support use of a broader genomic profiling approach. And I hope after Jody's talk, it becomes more clear how the knowledge base reporter can help with the interpretation and understanding the clinical significance of these genomic findings. So case one is actually a shoulder biopsy with a scan tissue. So here's the zoom up view. You can see the bone trabeculae on the bottom corner of this uh, histology specimen, and there's, very, and there's limited tumor cells unmixed within the sample. Uh, the assay had no problem uh, testing this and showed uh, an ERBB2 or HER2 insertion. And per the guidelines, this individual may benefit from uh, targeted agents. In this case, the person actually received uh, a targeted agent and has continued to have stable disease three months out. 
Uh, case two is a liver mass with unknown primary, uh, although a lung was uh, suspected. Testing showed uh, exon splicing mutation with DNA portion of the assay and the RNA confirmed corresponding uh, transcript showing exon 14 mutation. I mean, I think this case highlights the value of doing both the DNA RNA testing for this mutation together. This sample was actually also tested by a commercial genomic profiling company, which identified the mutation but called it a VUS, kind of showing some of the challenges to reporting and interpretation. Uh, this exon 14 skipping mutation should be characterized as a pathogenic mutation, and there are targeted agents uh, that can be used. Actually, this individual did receive Kersotinib and responded uh, um, with a good response for six months. And finally, case three shows what is a challenging diagnosis uh, to a uh, pathologist. This was uh, thought to be perhaps a cholangiocarcinoma or, or, or perhaps it was not a malignant process and was some sort of bile duct proliferation. So testing was done to help uh, assist this and a BRF E600 mutation was detected, which helped favor the diagnosis of an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Furthermore, this individual went on to treat anti therapy and continues to have stable disease uh, six months out. So I think in conclusion, uh, I, just, I think the take home is that in the era of uh, genomic profiling, the ability to successfully and accurately assay small and challenging samples with increasing complexity is critical. Um, I have provided uh, data for such for one such method using the INTARN system. Uh, I thank you for your time, and we'll pass it now back to Julia. Thank you very much, Dr. Sadri. As a quick reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. So next up is Dr. McIntyre. Please go ahead. Hello, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, Oncomine Knowledge Base Reporter and how that simplifies the interpretation of relevant cancer variants. So just to highlight the challenge that Dr. Sadre was mentioning, there are a growing number of oncology biomarkers with potential clinical utility. And as these NGS paths get larger, there's more and more markers and variants to be annotated. And the goal is, of course, to accurately annotate and associate relevant information to those markers. And current methods are time intensive and require extensive research from multiple data sources to map relevant information to variants. So the way we've uh, approached this challenge is in two ways. One, by developing a knowledge base, and secondly, by delivering that knowledge base in a very easy to use software that allows you to create custom reports. So on this slide, I'm gonna talk first about our knowledge base curation. And the first step in that curation process is to assemble all the data from global clinical uh, websites, from clinicaltrials.gov, different clinical trial registries across the world, as well as US and European labels and guidelines. We take all of that information and put it into our analytical pipelines. And that is brought to our content curation team, who is a team that are experts in translational oncology and are able to manually curate the data and QC the data to bring that into the knowledge base. That knowledge base then informs not only the development of our Oncomine assays, such as the Oncomine focus assay that was just presented by Dr. Sadri, but also it informs our Oncomine knowledge base reporter software. And just to appreciate the, the enormity of the global clinical trials that we cover in uh, Oncomine Knowledge Base Reporter, this is just a global picture of all the regions and countries that we cover within the software. So you can filter and find clinical trials for your samples of interest, depending on your region. So this is a, another way to look at our oncology research uh, workflow. So I'm going to talk now about the software and how that fits into the uh, Oncomine assay workflow that's been developed for our oncology research assays. And um, Dr. Sadri already talked about the sample to answer workflow. I'm going to focus more on the post-sequencing analysis with Iron Reporter and Oncomine Knowledge Base Reporter. 
So our analysis really starts with the sequencing into a BAM file, and that, that aligned file then gets in, incorporated into Ion Reporter for annotation and identifying cancer drivers. And then we take those cancer drivers and those BCF files can be brought into Alchemy Knowledge Base Reporter to link to relevant published labels, guidelines, and clinical trials. And so the rest of my talk, I'm gonna show you how easily it is to use Alchemy Knowledge Base Reporter uh, to get access to these data. So as I mentioned, Alchemy Knowledge Base Reporter is a really easy to use interface. There's three steps to create a custom report. The first step is to upload your VCF, then you're gonna filter, decide what goes into your report, and then finally generate your report. So here's the first step. Uh, in Alchemy Knowledge Base Reporter, where you're choosing your VCF file that's been annotated, and you're gonna choose a filter preset. For this example, I'm gonna use the demo filter preset we have that includes all of the content uh, in Alchemy Knowledge Base Reporter. You upload that VCF file and that brings you to this filter content page or filtering page where you're able to decide what you would like to have in your report. So you can see at the top, we, we have the uh, sort of a summary of your VCF file, the name of your VCF file, what cancer type your VCF file was and we have chosen this demo filter preset, which includes the FDA, NCCN, EMA, and ESMO guidelines, as well as clinical trials. And you see a sort of a, a preview of the content of your report below uh, this filter, your filter options. So many of our users may decide not to filter any of the content and go ahead now and create your report. But if you want to filter for your specific sample, you can expand the, the filter details here, click on that show filter details, and that brings up a larger filter box here that includes all the data sources, the clinical trial location, as well as clinical trial phases. And now you have the flexibility to remove data sources you may not be interested in. If you're only interested in European data sources or US data sources, you can customize what you would like to see in that report. For this example, I'm gonna filter, I'm gonna use all the data sources but filter on uh, Germany or clinical trials in Germany. And I can apply that to this, this uh, particular sample. Now I may want to keep this filter preset and save that for the next time. So next time I have another VCF, I'm gonna to continue to look at Germany clinical trials. In that case, I can save the filter preset and that becomes, you can name it, so I'm gonna name it Germany Clinical Trials with all of our data sources. And then that becomes part of the dropdown in that upper left-hand corner. And now I can use that as a filter preset in any of my uh, analysis going forward. So that's step two, defining your content and the filters for your report. And the third step is then going ahead and generating your report. So this is the generate report screen and you have several options here. The main option is defining your report template and I'm gonna talk more about how easy it is to customize and create your own report template. Um, in this case, uh, we also have added in the report template some sample uh, info uh, boxes so you can add in your own sample information uh, to the top of the report and I'll show you where that is. These are optional and you could add as many of these uh, dynamic fields as you would like for every time you uh, run a report, you could add information or the user could add that information. Um, in this particular window, you also can decide if you want page numbers, you can decide the file name for your report, you can decide if you would like a grayscale or color report. If you want to fax it, you may choose grayscale. And you can select the output, whether you want a PDF report, which is our standard output, or a text file. So finally, we generate the report. And this is an example of a quote unquote single page report. Uh, we now have the ability to uh, create our reports um, and decide which uh, pieces of the information you want to have in the report. 
And so you could create a single page report if you wanted something very short. And that, of course, depends on the number of variants in the sample. But our typical first page, of course, has a header, which is very customizable. You can see that sample information that I added here. This is an optional section. You could add and you could build on this if you have a standard set of information you want for your sample. Then we have index and report highlights that, especially if you decide to have a longer form of the report, you may want to know uh, what page your clinical trials start on and the clinical trial details. And then the variant summary lists all your variants in the sample as well as a summarized view of all the tar targeted therapies within the cancer type. And you also have the option to show out of cancer type uh, therapies as well. And these are color coded by uh, indicated or contraindicated as defined by our data sources um, that are listed below, FDA, NCCN, EMA, and ESMO. And then you can see the high level uh, number of clinical trials, and this is because we have filtered this particular report down by just showing clinical trials in Germany, which happens to be 12. We have another section here showing the variant details. If you want to take, you want the genomic information from your BCF file, you have the option to bring in this variant details section, which then can be uh, customized. You can decide what order these columns are in, um, and in fact, you can decide you know, not to have it at all or put it in a different part of the report if you like with our report builder, which I'm gonna show you next. But just to follow on this example, this is the first page of this BRAF B600E report. Um, a typical report will also include a relevant therapy summary, which goes to the next level of detail for all the relevant therapies for each of your variants and showing all the information per data source. And we use these icons to indicate in this cancer type, is a full circle, uh, open circle other cancer type or sort of half and half for in this cancer type or other and other cancer type. Then we have some contraindicated therapies here or both for use in contraindicated. And all of these icons then are explained in our detail sections, which are in the next sections of the report. So if that's page two, then the next pages indicate, these are some examples of the information that we curate and provide in the report. This is some example of the FDA information for uh, the therapies for BRAF B600E, and this is uh, in, uh, an example of the ESMO information. And as you can uh, imagine, these would, would, you'd have a section of these for each of your variants. And then we uh, also, lastly, we have the clinical trial information. These are two different clinical trials. Again, we filtered by uh, clinical trials in Germany, so you see two different examples. Um, we have definitely one example that's from uh, clinicaltrials.gov. We provide a link out to that within the report, so you can bring up the entry in clinicaltrials.gov. And then we have another one that is from our additional clinical trials registries outside of clinicaltrials.gov. So it has some other identifiers and information. We also offer the, uh, this report in 10 different local languages. I'm just showing here the same report, or the same first page of the report in German and also in Chinese. Uh, and we offer this in 10 different languages. So I just have a few more slides to show you how easy it is to customize these reports for your own lab. So you would create your own report template, and as I mentioned, we do support 10 uh, local languages, so you would select the language for your report, you would select the, your template name, you would decide how you want to present your variants, do you want to present the short uh, version of variants or the longer full uh, gene name for your variants, and then you would use your report builder to decide what sections of the report you want. I'm going to just zoom in on that report builder in the next slide here. So the report builder uh, allows you to decide if you want report highlights. You know, most are gonna include a variant summary, but you may or may not want the variant details. These are all the different sections you can include, as well as decide if you want page breaks and where you want those page breaks to appear. We definitely have users that prefer to have a longer extended report, and we also have users that prefer a short report. So this report builder gives you ultimate flexibility to choose the sections and what order you want to present uh, in the section. 
Then we have a report template key that allows you to customize, put in your own logo, put in your uh, lab name, address, and what other, and some other flexible uh, labels that could either be standard text that you have on every report or dynamic fields that you could fill out uh, on as you uh, bring in each BCF file. So as you can see, all of this customization then brings you to the report template. As I showed before, this is just showing you again, this is all the customization that we put into this report. So finally, just want to summarize that Ankhamai Knowledge Base Reporter has been developed as a single source of curated content for labels, guidelines, and open clinical trials to allow you to associate um, per sample uh, oncology biomarkers um, to labels, guidelines, and clinical trials. Of course, it's, and we update it quarterly. I've just shown you how easy it is to use. There's just very few steps to create uh, your report, and we, have, we have provide that report in 10 local languages. Uh, the, our curated content is scrutinized by a team of curation experts that make sure that all that information is contextualized and categorized and the reports are consistent and accurate. So Alkaline Knowledge Base Reporter is available for installation on your local server. That includes an, app, uh, an API, or you can log in and use our web-based version in the Thermo Fisher Connect, which is powered by the Thermo Fisher Cloud. And if you want to try out and show, just you know, use one of your samples and try out Onkamai Knowledge Base Reporter, we do have an offer, a demo report, where um, it's on thermofisher.com front slash OKR dash promo, and you can fill out with very um, small amount of information, an email address so we can contact you, and if you have a thermofisher.com cloud account, we can enable you to uh, have a demo report experience, or we can provide you a demo PDF so you can see the report uh, in your own hands. And I think, uh, thank you very much for your time, and I'll now turn it back over to uh, Julia. Thank you, Dr. McIntyre. So before we enter the Q&A, we would just like to ask our attendees to take a brief moment after the webinar has ended to take our exit survey and provide us with your feedback. So let's now jump right into the Q&A. Uh, we have a number of questions for both of our presenters. So let's start with Dr. Sadri. Um, so one specific question about a case presented just to clarify, how was the hotspot assay able to detect the ALK fusion and was a special probe set made, made specifically to detect this? Sure, the Oncomine focus assay is not actually just a hotspot assay. It has hotspots, but it's also able to detect copy number variants and fusion. And the RNA is used to detect uh, the fusion that comes within the assay. It's a DNA RNA assay. Right, thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, another question for you, can you provide a few more details on how you process the samples with regard to extracting the DNA and RNA? Yes, uh, there's a number of uh, kits there. Um, there are kits and automated systems. Uh, we primarily use the manual Kaigen All Prep FFP kit that allows you to uh, isolate both RNA and DNA out of a sample. Okay, thanks. And uh, related to that, do you believe that the way the formalin fixation is done affects the result? And would you recommend a specific protocol to fix the samples in formalin? Uh, yes, I think overfixation and underfixation both have uh, effects. I described a uh, well-known phenomenon such as deamination that is somewhat related to uh, the formalin fixation time. So I think some standardization needs to be done, as we've learned from uh, uh, HER2 with uh, breast. But so you want to get the samples into formalin, and you don't want to keep them that long. And we have gone back and sites that have uh, issues in our end and tried to change their processing to more streamline this. Okay, thank you. A couple of questions for Dr. McIntyre. 
So first of all, is the Oncomine knowledge base report a standalone application and can it also be used with other sequencing platforms? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, can you hear me? The question yes, was about... we can hear you. Thanks. No? Okay, thank you. Just double checking. Uh, sure. The question is about Oncomine Knowledge Base Reporter. It was developed specifically for our Oncomine assays um, that we provide through the IAM platform. Um, and so we, right now, it, it supports our IAM Torrent uh, oncology assays. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, can you provide a few numbers uh, about the knowledge base, for example, the number of genes curated, the variants, the drug associations, clinical trials, and is there a way to add new annotations? So we update those annotations on a quarterly basis. Um, we do provide all the statistics of labels, guidelines, and clinical trials with our release notes that we, we provide. Um, I don't happen to have all those numbers handy. Um, but we do uh, we do have those numbers, and I'm happy to provide those offline to the person who's asking the question. Sure, thank you. Um, can the knowledge base be used with the FDA-approved Oncomine assay? And if it cannot, is there an equivalent tool to be used? Right. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so at this point, uh, Oncomine Knowledge Based Reporter is a research use only uh, software and used for clinical research. Um, our targeted DX assay is a separate offering and we do include a report uh, that is similar but not the same as the Oncomine Knowledge Based Reporter output, but that is included in our target DX test in the software. Okay, thank you. He, uh, question for Dr. Saudry. Um, can you say a little more generally how much effort and training is needed to implement an NGS oncology panel like this in your lab? I think there, uh, the assay itself is very, uh, it's easy to use, but I do think that there needs to be some knowledge of NGS uh, beforehand. As from a technical standpoint, the techs were able to pick up the assay very uh, easily, but I think from an analysis standpoint, even though there are a lot of tools that uh, Eintorin does provide, I think good basic knowledge of NGS, uh, its benefits and pitfalls is needed to accurately analyze the data. Okay, thank you. Um, Question for Dr. McIntyre, what is the time to result once a biopsy is received and a report is sent to the clinician? So, good question. So, I think Dr. Sadri um, mentioned it was, um, his turnaround time was less than a week. So, actually generating the report in Oncomine Knowledge Base Reporter happens in seconds. Great, thank you. Um, let me just make sure. Dr. Sari, very quick question. So how many individuals actually work in your lab on this NGS workflow? Uh, we have normally one tech running the workflow. We have actually two techs running this, but we run a number of other uh, cancer assays. So one tech normally handles uh, this workflow and we run this assay uh, or some portion of this assay twice a week. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, question for Dr. McIntyre again. Does this product have gene and variant descriptions and efficacy evidence that labs may add to or amend? Yeah, so we provide the ability to add additional information um, in the report, so we have custom fields um, that you can you can that are very flexible, and you could add that type of information in the report certainly. Okay, thank you. 
And another question for you, uh, can you speak to the potential of using plasma on the ion torrent? So we definitely have assays looking into the use of plasma. I don't have the details of that uh, handy right in front of me. Apologize. Okay, no problem. Um, Dr. Sarji, are you using this panel now to replace the ALK and ROS1 fish assays? Uh, yes, we have um, we have the Vandana ALK IC uh, in house. We normally use that if we want to confirm a test or if uh, the RNA fails on a sample. But for the most part, this has replaced both EGFR and ALK testing. Okay, that's interesting, yeah. Uh, Dr. McIntyre, um, can users multi-select variants to annotate clinical trials, for example, if a patient has a, a BRAF and a TP53 mutation uh, to find clinical trials for them? So the, the variants that come up um, are based on the sample. So yes, um, the the clinical trials are added based on the variance in the sample. So it, we also have the ability to search if you want to search separately by variance. So if you want to search for BRAF and TP53 outside of a specific uh, sample, you could do that as well. So the answer is yes. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sadri, um, when would you decide to use an NGS panel versus a single point mutation assay, such as a PCR assay for EGFR? I think for any patient that hasn't been, or for any individual that hasn't been uh, tested, we normally use a panel in specific cases where we're looking for uh, resistance, such as T790M, we may just use an uh, individual case. If um, there's very limited amount of material. Uh, we can also defer that to uh, EGFR testing, although in our hands, if the sample works for EGFR, it will work for the panel. There's very few cases where it will fail the panel, but yet still give a result for EGFR alone. All right. Um, another rather specific question on the NGS assay, can you comment on, on the depth of sequencing required for that assay? Um, some of the statistics, we have an average depth, not that it's required, but the average depth for all our samples is close to 2,500. So the depth is actually pretty high. We load uh, six to seven samples on a 318 chip. Um, we get that uh, sort of depth. I, I, we don't need that, but it, there's plenty of uh, space to get that depth. Okay, thanks. And another question related to one of the previous questions, do you confirm all ALK or ROSC NGS positive results with fish assays? So I think there's still a lot of debate as to between the which is the better detection, fish, uh, IHC, or um, PCR NGS, and there are a lot of studies within that. We tend to, if there's a questionable case, we do use IHC just to confirm it, but we don't actually confirm all uh, cases that come through. Okay. Um, and how did you validate the NGS assay? What guidelines did you follow, and what parameters should be included for validation? I think I kind of showed our uh, put our uh, kind of quick view that we use. We basically are using uh, uh, both the guidelines that are starting to come out of CAP, but also um, MoldyX, which is the big Medicare uh, uh, unit that kind of deals with val uh, with uh, dealing with reimbursement to these things. So we're using a couple of different. Uh, parameters that are out there to kind of use the most extensive way of validating these. All right, thanks. Uh, other question for Dr. McIntyre. Uh, how do you keep up with FDA drug changes and how are you sourcing your drug efficacy evidence?
Hello, are you Dr. Asking, McIntyre? Are you asking? Are you there, Dr. McIntyre? Yes, I'm here. Sorry. So the mm -hmm. FDA drug changes. Uh, we are all of that information is part of the information we um, get from the FDA as well as the other data sources. So we we have the ability to take that information and curate it. So we do that on a regular basis and update that to our users on a quarterly basis. Okay, thank you. And just as a reminder, if you have additional questions, please do submit them now. We still have a few minutes to go. Um, please put them into the Q&A box. In the meantime, we have another question um, for Dr. Sadri. For the few samples where you didn't have adequate sample material, adequate material, um, and couldn't process that with the Oncomine panel, do you think liquid biopsies would be a viable test option? I think uh, liquid biopsies are perhaps helpful in certain instances. I mean, there's some newer work showing that maybe per RAS testing and colorectal cancer. I think it is still not there for a full, broader profiling for lung cancer. If you're looking for a specific mutation such as T790M, uh, that may be helpful, but for broader profiling where you should be able to detect fusions in the rest, I don't think there is a, uh, a good enough assay out there to be able to do that currently. Okay, thanks. And another question for you, Dr. Sadri. Um, how do you see testing needs evolve as more lung cancer markers are being discovered and connected to therapies and clinical trials? And do you have any plans to expand beyond the current gene panel on the Oncomine focus assay? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. I think things are always evolving. Actually, we are currently on the new level of actually expanding upon the Oncomine focus assay. So we've actually gone in and designed our own uh, amplicons on top of the assay. Uh, for people who want something more out of the box, there is, uh, you know, some of the bigger panels, such as the same panel that's being used for NCI match, such as the on-command comprehensive panel that could be used. But uh, I think the ease of the ion torrent system is that you can very easily build upon the assay to keep up with the changing system. Okay, thanks. Uh, another very specific question for Dr. Sari. What was the minimum variant LE frequency in the assay? Um, can you repeat that again? What is the, I don't understand the nature of the question. What's the minimum, minimum allele frequency, I, I guess, you could detect in the assay? I guess that's the question. Uh, so the limit of detection that we're striving is for uh, uh, a variant allele frequency of 5%. We can detect uh, below that, but that's the cutoff that we're trying to maintain, 5%. I see, okay. Um, Dr. McIntyre, will the Oncomine Knowledge Base Reporter work with any VCF file of cancer variants that somebody uploads? For example, will it work with custom AmpliSeq panels or also with non ion torrent panels? Um, that's a good question. Uh, we, we get that often. Uh, we. We have designed it for our Oncomine and Oncology assays today, and we are looking to support more of the custom AmpliSeq assays in, in our future releases. Great, thank you. And then uh, final question. So this demo report you um, showed during the presentation, how long would that be available for? Oh, we plan to offer that at least until the end of the year. So, um, yeah, we'd be very happy for those who are interested in seeing more about the report. You could fill out that information and we'll get right back to you and send it over. Great, thank you. So it looks like this is all the questions we have at this point. So with that, uh, we'd like to thank our speakers today, both Dr. Navid Sadri and Dr. Jody McIntyre, as well as our sponsor, Iron Torrent. And um, as a reminder, please look out for the pop-up survey that, when, that you receive when you log out to provide us with your feedback on this webinar. Also, if you have missed any part of this webinar or wish to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. With that, thank you very much for joining us for this genome webinar. <laughs>